the name that is greater than any challenge you're facing this morning. It is the name of Jesus. Why don't you lift up that name? The name of Jesus this morning. Come on, church. Come on, Stellenbosch. Come on, Maris. Come on, Christen. We're not religious this morning. We serve a God who is alive this morning. We serve a God who hears us. We serve a God who is not far from us. We serve a God who is in us. We serve a God who is for us. Come on, make a joyful noise in this place this morning. Come, Stellenbosch. Come on, Maris. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, and amen. It's glad to hear you're alive this morning, amen. We're not religious. We have the Spirit of God living in us. The greater is He that's in us, the great new worship song we sang this morning. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. I don't care what your challenge is this morning. When Christ is in you, you have the ability to overcome. You already, you might not have seen the overcoming power yet, but you have it in you right now. You might not have seen the promise, but you have it in you. We take it by faith this morning. Amen. So when we rejoice like this at the end of worship, when we lift up our hands and clap and scream, we not, haven't lost our minds. We are just possessing our atmosphere by faith. Amen. That is what you need to do. Possess your atmosphere by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. When you're sitting at home or you're at work or something's pressing you, wants to push you down, you have to get up and just start to worship Jesus. In your car, the guy in the free air might think you've lost your mind. doesn't matter what he thinks, for greater is he that is in you this morning. Amen. <clears throat> Turn to your neighbor really one more time. Give your neighbor a high five. Don't slap your neighbor. Slap your neighbor a high five. Welcome somebody here this morning. Thank somebody for being here this morning. Smile at somebody this morning. Shake somebody's hand. Make somebody feel welcome this morning. Amen. You can be seated. Great to have you in the house this morning. Welcome to Stellenbosch this morning, the great church of Stellenbosch. Welcome to Hermanus, where they have a whale of a time every single Sunday. Welcome to you. If you're visiting us for the first time this morning, great to have you here. And the next week, uh, we're having Mother's Day in the house, and uh, we'll have Pastor Lisa Bevere live in the house. So for those of you that are uh, want to bless your mothers, bring your mothers. Um, the lady said they don't want to hear a man preach, they want to hear a woman preach on Mother's Day. So we'll give you your, uh, your wishes. So uh, bring, your, bring your, your, your friends, your family. It's going to be a great Sunday next week. We're going to be honoring all the mothers. And those of you that want to fall pregnant, come as well, because there'll be a pregnancy spirit in the house next Sunday. Amen. This is a grappi. Put your hands together this morning. Come on, welcome Stilmosh. Welcome, Hermanus. Welcome all of our visitors. Great to have you here this morning. I want to continue speaking to us this morning about the God of the get up. Bump your neighbor really in your left hand side. Tell him, get up, brother, get up. John chapter 11, verse 25. The Bible says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Many challenges people facing today is not God that's turned away from them or God that's become silent with them. It's their belief, where their belief uh, stands or is in their life. And Jesus speaks to Lazarus' family. Jesus starts to demonstrate the resurrection power that we as Christians today have the privilege of having inside of us. Paul the Apostle said, I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. I don't want to know him just in the things that got him down, but I want to know him in the power of the resurrection. It is resurrection power that gives us the ability to be called Christians. Many Christians are out there taking a uh, strain in life, which is natural. Jesus says that you will be challenged in this life, and don't think it's uncommon to take some strain at some times in your life. But the Bible says a Christian has the ability to overcome. The Christian has the ability to get up from any circumstance. The Christian. But the Bible says you have to possess it because greater is he that's in you. It's a spiritual walk. It's not a natural walk. We're in the world. We're not of the world, says the Bible. So as Pastor has been speaking in the evening services about a new DNA, you are born again. There's a blood transfusion that takes place. Your spirit changes. God comes to live on the inside spiritually. You still look like the old person on the outside. You still sound the same. Your, your voice, your personality, your sense of humor uh, might still, everything stays the same. But your, what happens on the inside is your spirit the human spirit which everyone is born with you're born with a spirit you are born with a body you are born with a mind you have a brain you have a thought process but you have to connect that natural life to a spiritual life and Jesus says to to Lazarus's family they come to him despondent they say Lazarus your friend is dead 
Jesus is still alive. He hasn't died yet. He hasn't risen yet. He hasn't ascended yet. He hasn't sent the Holy Spirit. But he starts to demonstrate what life could be like when he's not here. And he says, why are you worrying about death? I'm going to solve death's problem. I see many Christians. I, my brother-in-law was electrocuted to death at 35. My father's gone to be with the Lord. Many of my family have gone to be with the Lord. But the reality of the fact is we should never blame God or hold things against God when natural things happen to us. Because Jesus came and said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Notice life follows resurrection power. Once you understand resurrection, everything that you start to touch, everything you start to put your hand on will start to live. Because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said to, to us in John 10, 10, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. So we as Christians, although we are under pressure, although we face challenges, although our minds might be tested, although our flesh might go through challenges, although our, our hope might become despondent at times, the Bible says we have the ability to get up from any set of circumstances. That is the hope we have as, as Christians. And we should never lose that hope. Many other religions out there in the world, what they, they have a form. Paul says, he speaks to us, he says, many people have a form of godliness, but they don't have what we have, resurrection power. The ability to, to rejoice when things don't always seem like they're going well. Oh, yeah, this morning. So 1 John 4, 17, the last few weeks we've been, we were looking at, uh, the Bible says, for as he is in this world, so are we. As he is, so are we in this world. So the Bible says that as Jesus is, so are we. How is he? He's resurrected, he's overcome, he's victorious, he's alive, amen, he defeated death, he defeated sin, but pastor, I'm still sinning. I understand that you're in this world, but he's overcome sin, amen, when you look to him. If you try to overcome sin by yourself, it'll become a very difficult thing to try and overcome, but he has overcome sin. That's why we come to church and we lift up our hands. That's why we come to church every Sunday, we come to worship him. We come to bow our knee before his lordship because he has overcome we are still busy overcoming. So when you are still falling, your flesh is falling short, the Bible says don't condemn yourself because he understood that you'll have weakness in this world. We don't condone sin. The Bible doesn't condone sin. God doesn't like sin, but he understands the natural process we humans are under. And he sent us a solution, his son, Jesus. And he said, I've come to defeat sin and death. It's great news. That's why he's the God of the second chance, the God of the 10th chance, the God of the 40th chance. Can you say amen this morning? Many people struggle with that because they're still trying to please God in their flesh. The Bible said before you even knew anything about Christ, before we could act spiritual or act holy, before we knew things out of the Bible, we were on the bar counters of the world. We were lost to sin. And now he saved us and now we're trying to please him. Yet he pleased his father by going to the cross for us. Get it in your spirit. That's why he says to, to Lazarus' family, to Mary and all the sisters, they, 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 they disappointed, which is natural for us to be disappointed at times. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I am the resurrection. And the same power that's going to raise me from the dead is going to live inside of you. That's why Christians, we should be the most optimistic people on the planet. Amen. Not the, the great big judges that I see many Christians are prone to become. Want to judge everybody that's made a mistake. Want to judge everybody that, that, that's fallen into sin. Because we ourselves are all sinners saved by grace. That's the good news. So here yeah, this morning. So how was Jesus in this world? He's alive. He's resurrected. He's victorious. He's triumphant. He's above and not beneath. And so we are above and not beneath. You are royalty. We worshiped it this morning. You are royalty. When Jesus entered your, 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 your spirit spiritually, when God entered your life spiritually, there was a blood transfusion. You are now royalty. You are more royal than the Queen of England. Amen. The Queen of England has a natural royalty. They roll out the red carpet for her naturally. But you have a spiritual royalty. When you say something, when you ask heaven something, they say, hey, there's the prince down there. There's a young little king down there. There's a young little Christian down there who has the blood of Jesus in him. And that's why we can, con we can, we can bind and we can loose on the earth. Are you here this morning? So last week we spoke about laying a foundation. Last week we spoke about getting up in your dreams. Five areas we looked at, getting up in your dreams. I'm going to continue this morning encouraging our faith. Getting up in your dreams. Everyone should have a dream, a vision. Because God is a God of dreams. God is a God of vision. God is a God of purpose. Amen. The plan that you have, the, the gifting you have, God gave you a gift. Your gift is different. It's unique. Your fingerprint is unique. You, you, you might be part of someone else's dream. It's natural. But you should have a dream in your heart to fulfill something bigger than yourself. And God gives Abram, the, in the Bible, God gives Abram a dream. He has a man who God 
calls out to, he says, uh, Abraham, will you follow me? Yes, I will. He says, now I want to give you a dream. I'm going to give you a, a purpose, a vision. He says, go outside. Lift up your eyes and look. He says, what do you see? He says, I see the stars. He says, count them. He says, how many do you count? He says, I can't count them. They, 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 they are uncountable. He says, that is how many children you're going to have. He says, God, there's a bit of a challenge. I'm 100 years old. My wife is 90. He says, I don't know if you know genetics, God, but things get difficult at that age. How's this going to be possible? But God gives him a promise. The Bible says Abram believes God. Many people's problem today is they don't believe God. They believe every Facebook post, every blog, every article, every news report, every negative comment. They believe their, their, their unsaved family members' opinions, but they won't believe God. And you have to know His Word because when you read His Word, His Word is His promise. And so the Bible says, Abram believes God. And he says, okay, God, I'll leave it up to you. You get my wife pregnant. I'll do my best from my side. But God, you've got to do the rest. And God gives him a promise. Get up on your dreams. But how many of you know the dream that God gave Abraham took 25 years to come to fulfillment? How many of you this morning sitting in this place love Jesus? I'm sure everybody. How many of you have a dream in your heart? I hope everybody. But how many of you might be sitting here this morning saying, Pastor, how long? God will decide how long. What you have to do is hold on to the dream. You have to get up in your hope this morning. You have to allow hope to stay alive in your life. I mean, imagine 25 years. I was at a drive through recently. We live in this fast, instant world. And we arrived at the drive through my family and I, recently, and we ordered some food and the, the drive, the, at the drive through the person said, the chicken you want to order is gonna take five minutes. I mean, five minutes, that's unacceptable. We want it now, isn't it? And so we become irritable with five minutes. Now wait in the parking lot. I mean, that five minutes seemed like five years. And all the, all the way it was like, this company is ridiculous. I mean, we should contact management. Five minutes. But we live in this instant world. I mean, you all know what it's like when your data buffers, when, the, when your Wi-Fi is not working. I mean, call the manager. Today, we're not complaining about bad service in a restaurant. We're complaining about the, the size of the data they're offering. I mean, your bandwidth is pathetic. Get a bigger bandwidth because we want faster data. Amen. Isn't it? We live in this instant world. Information comes to us instantly. Yet the promises of God comes to us instantly. But the process takes time. And God says to Abraham, I've got a dream for you. 25 years later, we only see Isaac being born. You have to get up in your hope this morning. Listen to what the Bible says, Romans 4.18. Paul writing to the church, New Testament. He's speaking about the man called Abraham. He's talking to the church in Rome who were becoming despondent in planting the early church, becoming despondent in the promises of seeing their dreams come to fulfillment. Romans 4.18, he says, Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. But notice this, the Bible says, Abraham, who contrary to hope, there was a promise, he had his hope in something, he believed in something, he was hoping for this thing to come to fulfillment like all of us this morning, we're hoping for something, an increase in our career, a breakthrough in our business, something, we're hoping for something, but the Bible says when Abram was waiting for this promise to come to fulfillment during the 25 year process, he could have become despondent, he could have changed direction in his hope, but the Bible says Abram who contrary to hope. His hope was contrary. Listen to what the dictionary describes the word contrary as. The word contrary is, means opposite in nature. It means opposite in character. It means opposite in direction. It means opposite in position. The word contrary means diametrically and mutually opposite to the facts. The Bible says Abram, while he was waiting for God's promise to come to fulfillment of Isaac, his wife, to fall pregnant, which was impossible in the natural according to his mind, was impossible. The Bible said while he was waiting, everything was directly in op opposition to the facts. God, I know you said this, but if I look at my real world, the facts, it's in direct opposition to what you said. And the Bible said in that moment, Abram had a choice. Do I hold on to the hope or do I start to look at the facts? And many Christians I find since I've been serving Jesus, they start to alter their doctrine to accommodate their circumstances. The minute God promises them something, they believe it for a season, but when it doesn't come to fulfillment instantly or quickly according to our timing, 
we then start to say words like, well, maybe it's not God's will. We adjust our doctrine to accommodate our circumstances. My challenge to us this morning is do not do that. Don't alter, your, your, don't alter the promise of God. Hold on to the promise. The Bible said, Abraham, who contrary to hope, chose hope. He chose the promise of God. He said, God, you said it. I believe it. And if I believe it this morning, Lord, I don't care how long it takes, but you said it. You're not a man that you should lie. You're not a human that will make a promise and pull back on that promise. You're not my boss who said he'll give me increase and didn't give it to me. No, you are God. You love me so much. You have hope for me. The Bible says God wants to begin a good work in us. But very often, we want to have the, the manifestation of the promise instantly. I mean, the first thing that God does when he gives you a promise is he starts to work on you. Because very many people, I mean, th- look, just watch statistics. People play the lottery. I'm sure none of us play the lottery yet because we're blessed enough. We don't need to play the lottery. Just look straight ahead of you if you're praying for, in tongues this morning for your six numbers to come to pass. Isn't it amazing? We'll go and spend hard-earned money on a, on a piece of paper at a store and then suck out six numbers from a number plate and then start to see God in this equation. And then it's a super-duper bumper crop of instant money. And then you win this lottery. Let's assume you win the lottery. But the good work that God began in you, he hasn't even got halfway. Did you know that when Adam was on the earth, he was incomplete? I mean, I tell my family, I said, did you know, before Adam and Eve sinned, before they took the, 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 the fruit from the tree of good and evil, every animal didn't have an evil nature in him. So Adam walked next to the lion. The lion didn't want to bite him because the lion didn't know what evil was because evil wasn't on the earth. Because God was still busy forming Adam. He hadn't finished Adam yet. He said, Adam, rest tonight and then I'll come back tomorrow. We'll continue this process. So God was still busy forming Adam when Adam's nature changed and the lion's nature changed and man's nature changed and evil entered the earth. Amen. But God was busy forming him. And so when God sent Jesus to the earth, for the very first time, there was a perfect, complete human on the earth, Jesus. That's why the Bible calls him the last Adam, not the, not the second Adam. Because he's not trying to be like Adam, because Adam was incomplete. Amen. So today when things happen in your life, remember this, is that although things will go against us, like sin entered the world through Adam, the Bible said Christ, when Christ's Spirit enters you, completion, perfection enters you. We're not perfect, but He in us is perfect. Amen. And we must understand that. And that's why the Bible says we can hold on to hope. We can hold on to the promises of God, no matter how bad things might seem. Are you here this morning? How many of you are there this morning, standing in this place saying, Pastor, I'm hoping for something, I'm believing in something, but it's contrary to hope. It's, it's everything that I'm facing right now is going in what seems like in direct opposite direction to what I'm believing God for. And that is what we have to hold on to this morning. We have to hold on to the promises and the belief of God. Notice what the King James Version says of that same scripture verse in verse B, Stellenbosch. The Bible says that he might become. Abram, who contrary to hope, in hope believed that he might become. You see, the good work, like I said earlier, God begins in you. If the lottery, if you win the lottery and the, and the, and the, the incomplete work that God has placed has started in you, and you get this lump sum of money, suddenly you get your, your values are going to start to change, your opinions are going to start to change, then suddenly you're going to start using things like, Pastor, I think my season is over. But it's not your season that's over, it's your completion that hasn't finished yet. And now the money has become more important to you than your, your purpose. Amen. Because the Bible says the good work God begins. So sometimes a promise takes a bit longer. It's not God delaying His promise, it's God busy working on you. So when he works on you, the first person he needs to change when he plants a church is the pastor. The first person God needs to change when you start a business is the owner. Oh, it's my staff. It's my staff. No, it's most likely you, sir. Because they only came to the business because you started something. But God starts with you. Amen. All the staff said, yes, it's you, pastor. Amen. But how many times are we like that? We find ourselves in a set of circumstances. We get married, and then we love this woman. She comes down the aisle. I was at the privilege of being at Pastor Art's son Davy's wedding this, this Friday. And when he saw, yeah, what you call it, coming down the aisle, you can see he's licking his lips. And he, he, she looks like a 300 Coke bottle, and everything's in shape, and everything's perfect. And then we live life with this person. But then God begins a good work in both of us. 
but then somewhere along the line I stop my process of good work my wife continues but I stop and then suddenly everything becomes her and not me now it's her it's her I mean when God comes to look for Adam what does he tell him he says Adam where are you why are you hiding from me I I'm still busy with you Adam he says no God he said it's this woman you gave me and he starts the blame game and all the ladies said mm, bump your husband say stop blaming me and allow the good work to continue in you but Abram's got a promise what happens along the way his wife comes and says listen honey I can't give you children obviously I'm not God's one for you why don't you take plan B and he gives him another woman to sleep with and they birth an Ishmael how many Christians are like that impatient to see the promises of God the original plan of God so we start justifying Ishmael's we start birthing plan B's because we were impatient with the good work God began in us and most likely when you are impatient or irritable don't blame anything just go to inner room and say Lord why am I so irritable he's going thank you listen change this do this but don't blame people that is why our nation is such a great nation but the minute you blame everybody else but yourself you're still incomplete allow the good work that God started in you to complete in you amen and if you're happy with something your wife is doing amen talk about those things but don't blame her pray for your boss if you see your boss doing things or you an employee or employer whatever you are the Bible says God wants to he wants you to become something he says so that Abram might become notice when God saw Abram he saw Isaac he saw the he saw the promise but yet he had to he had to complete Abram in a journey 25 years how long is your journey I don't know uh, uh, a dog takes three months and a human takes nine months to birth something an elephant takes 18 months and an oak tree takes a hundred years I don't determine that God determines that and sometimes I believe the greater the delay the greater the call because God's causing he's got a big work in you but can you imagine if God shows you the end of your life now today and you are where you are today I mean you'd stop walking by faith because you say well if that's where I'm gonna end I don't need to do anything to get there because God's already given me that but what he does is he he only gives you enough to walk by faith every day until you possess that promise so when people I, I hear people saying Cape Town's a difficult place no it's not a difficult place it's because you see it as a difficult place because God's busy with you but Cape Town's a blessed place that company you work for that you said you'll do anything for when you went for the interview and you said you're the most loyal person now you've got issues with that company listen let God continue to work in you in that company he put you there for a reason and if the boss says work overtime for free say no boss I'm a born-again spiritual Christian I'll work two weeks for free but who are you I'm, I'm I'm me but in me is the greater one and I'm here for a reason and sometimes when you start to sow seeds like Jesus sowed his life amen the good work I mean Jesus is in Gethsemane he's questioning his purpose God begins a work in his own son he sends his son to the earth God but he gives up the right to be God he, he comes in the form of man that's why he's called the son of man and while he's on the earth the Bible said he's tempted like you and I are in every area of our lives yet he never sinned the Bible said when he was in Gethsemane he pondered Calvary and he said wow that is gonna be painful the Bible said he resisted the temptation to quit on Calvary so much that his sweat became blood but we as humans we start out we make a commitment we make a promise to the point we, 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 we promise we promise we promise and then when we had enough we justify yeah I'm and this and this and yeah I come all the reasons but Jesus he tried to justify he said father if it's your will give this this call to somebody else then he went to see if he could find somebody else and Peter was sleeping he said yeah that's not gonna work it's like when the pastor comes to look for the the member or the Christian or whatever the, the, the staff and sometimes they're sleeping and it's not because they're not they're not committed it's because God wants you to go back to that place of separation and not depend on people but depend on him and call out to him because sometimes we want everybody I mean isn't it amazing when Lucifer was deceived he was formed as an angel of light to play music amen that's why he was he was and everybody so said oh Lucifer you're so brilliant that blew smoke up his nostril all day and he said oh that's great look at this I'm like a little mini God 
when I start to strum the guitar, or whatever it is, the harp or the keyboard, or I sing, everything stands still. I'm so brilliant, but yet he forgot who made him. And then when God started to say to him, Lucifer, he was an angel. He was part of the solution, as was Judas. He was part of the solution. But yet, somewhere along the line, Judas stopped allowing God to continue the good work in him. That's why God sends no one to hell. People reject his process in their life. Are you here this morning? I want to encourage our faith. Because for us to get up, very often we have to get up from our pride. We have to get up from our unforgiveness. We have to get up from our bitterness. We have to get up from our self-pity. And we have to hold on to the hope of the promise. Because it's not everybody else around you. Life owes us nothing. What we owe life is everything. Today we have the privilege again of lifting our hands, worshiping Jesus. What a privilege. But you're going through stuff like I'm going through stuff. But don't look for the blame game. Get into your inner room. The Bible says when you go into your inner room, you shut the door. Not your wife, not Facebook, not anybody else. No blame game, no, nothing, nothing. Just get in your room and fall on your knees and say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, come again. I need to get up. I'm, I'm down in the doldrums. It feels, like I'm, it feels like I'm going backwards. It feels like my world's falling apart. And he goes, I know, but get to the place of separation, not isolation. Isolation is where you start to hide yourself from the church and you start to blame the church. Separation is where you go away for a season in the sense of every day going to inner room, praying to God, but coming back and serving harder in the church. Amen. Because the greatest thing the enemy wants to do is attack your confidence. Because when he starts to attack... The first thing he attacks is your confidence. Because you started out, oh, I love Jesus, I serve Jesus. You go to your family, I'm born again, I'm spiritual. Look, I can pray in tongues. Shulia, Sulia, you're so spiritual. And then he chips away and he says, okay, a little door over there. Now, they, he's not, he can't destroy you, but he comes, he attacks. And what does he attack? He attacks your confidence. And when you start to lose your confidence, I mean, I watched one of our rugby teams play yesterday. And a little chunk, but he But... I don't support the team. I was, I was crying for them, but they were, they were crying. They, were, they got, a, they got a, whop, a whipping yesterday. And I was interested to see after the match, they were, the post-match interview, they spoke to the, 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 the presenters. And one of the presenters said, it's sad to see when a team loses their confidence. Because we know that team is able to do great things. They, they're a great rugby side. But when a team starts to lose its confidence or the coach loses its confidence or a Christian loses his confidence or the boss in a company loses his confidence because he goes to work and he didn't get the contract and he sees the bank balance isn't where it should be, then he starts to think contrary because right now you are the, everything's contrary to the hope that you have. It's not where you, where you want it to be. It's contrary. It's in opposite to what you want. I, I wanted that big business deal, but it didn't come. Now I'm sitting in, in, a, in a situation I don't know how to solve, and God goes, I know, but I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But instead of fighting God, I said to him, Lord, what do you, what do you want me to know through this, through this trial? Because in this trial comes truth. Because when you've, when you've got toothache, it's a trial. But when you go to the dentist, he takes away or she takes away the pain, but then truth comes. Truth is what? Oh, there's a hole in your tooth. But the trial caused you to experience the truth. Isn't it amazing? When you haven't got money in the bank or you're going through a financial challenge, it's a trial. Then you start to seek truth. I mean, have you seen all these guys? They, got, they fill stadiums with their autobiographies and they sell books. And when he was poor and I owned 17 islands and he's in his boat and his yacht drinking martinis on the beach and... But he tells you, I, I used to be here. What was it? He had a trial. Then he pursued truth. And now he's free. The Bible says grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. And whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. Amen. Are you here this morning? And sometimes as Christians, we're looking for truth in every other place but in Jesus. All these self-help books. And I'm, I'm very pro-reading. I'm very pro uh, uh, getting knowledge if you're a businessman because Jesus didn't, didn't give us uh, a chapter on how to make money in the Bible. He didn't do those things. He gave us principles on truth. Because in business, if you haven't got truth, you'll most likely do the deal under the table. Because your circumstances are contrary. I can't get the deal, but the guy says if I'll give him a, a little bit of a handshake over here. Now, what truth is in you? Are you going to say no to the handshake under the table so you can wait for the full promise. So you, 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 you lose this deal. You didn't take that. You lose the next. You didn't take that. That guy took it and looked like it was going well quickly. But yours is taking longer. But when yours comes to fulfillment, 
in 10 years from now. And you can handle the fulfillment. And God can give you millions upon millions because He can test you in the little. And when you're faithful in the little, the Bible says He'll make you rule over much. But many of us, we want much quickly, but we want to do very little. Like play the lottery. Play it now. 40 million. Pastor, God blessed me. Sure, He, must have, he did bless you. But, but my question is will we still see you in church as an usher? Will we still see you in the choir or in the band like you used to serve? Or is the money going to change your character? Oh, yeah, this morning. Word of encouragement to us. So we see, get up in our hopes. Hold on to the hope that God has for you. Jesus said, God said to Abram, I want to make you become the father of many nations. A word for someone this morning. God's going to make you become something that you, you haven't even seen yet. You've not even seen what God has seen for you. Because the Bible said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard of the things that have been laid up for those that love him. Some of you are seeing yourself through your natural eyes and by your surname and by your culture. But God sees you through his son, spiritually. The Bible says those things that your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard. Because to hear about that breakthrough contract in your business, you have to hear it. But you haven't heard it yet. But it's yours already. God sees it's yours. But he started a work in you. And allow him to, to continue the work in you until he says, okay, now you're ready. His disciples, Jesus spoke to his disciples harshly at times. He said, how long will I still struggle with you guys? How long am I going to repeat myself? I said it. Why are you asking me again? Because they didn't fully understand. Peter said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And when the pressure came, he did. But notice the grace of God. The first person he comes to look for when Peter, when he's ascended, he looks, I mean, res resurrected. He looks for Peter to say to him, listen, you might have made a mistake, but I'm a God of a second chance. You might have made a promise and not fulfilled it, but now let's go back stronger the second time. Let's not revisit the past. Let's go forward. Let's move forward. Let's get up. Come on, Peter, get up from your regret. Get up from your doubt. Get up from your lack. Get up from your self-pity. Come on. We can make a difference in this world. Are you here this morning? Amen. We have to get up in our hope because the enemy attacks our confidence. Hebrews 10, 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. There is a reward in holding on to your confidence. When you're not seeing what you think you should see, when you said God told you and you believed it, and you're not seeing it, the Bible said in that moment when you want to throw away that, 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 that business, that plan, that, that season, when you want to cast it away, the Bible says don't cast it away, hold on to it. Because the Bible said when you hold on to it, there's a great reward following holding on to the confidence in Christ. Verse 36, for you have need of endurance. Notice, Christian, this is a long race. It's not a 100-meter sprint. It's a, it's a marathon. Pace yourself. Amen. For you have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, what is the will of God? Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent us Jesus. That is the will of God. Pastor, is this career move God's will for me? Well, are you willing to take Jesus there? Yes. Then it's God's will. Because many people want to, want to make it a monetary thing or a comfort thing. But yes, are you going for Jesus? Are you going to represent Christ there? Is God opening up that door for you there so you can take Jesus there? Because that's the will of God. Is Jesus. Amen. Nothing more, nothing less. For God so loved the world that he sent us Jesus. That's his will for mankind. There is no other name by which man can be saved but by the name of Jesus. There is one mediator between God and man, Jesus. You cannot go to the Father but through Jesus. It's God's will, Jesus. And he says this, for you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, which is represent, take Jesus to the world, you may receive the promise. Amen. That's why when the enemy attacks us in our confidence, it starts to affect our minds. That's why we have to get up in our thoughts. When Timothy lost hope, when the church was going through much persecution, he wanted to quit being the pastor of the church. Somebody wants to quit this morning, maybe being the husband to the family. You want to quit being the, the owner of the company. You want to quit being the, the CEO of the company because you're going through some stuff. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, therefore, Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 6, he says, I remind you, as the Word of God is reminding us this morning, stir up the gift of God, which is you. Get up from that place of self-pity this morning, Timothy. He says, through the laying on of my hands. He says, verse 7, For God has not given us, Timothy, a spirit 
Notice a small spirit. That's your spirit. He is a big spirit. He will never be in, intimidated. He will never be in fear because he's God. But when he's in you and you start to act fearful, he says, hey, I understand that you are in a place of fear, but put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Amen. He said, come on. I'm with you. I mean you. I'm for you. Now get up, Timothy, from that place and walk out your destiny by faith. Possess your future. Amen. And he says this. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, Timothy, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Who is full of power? The Holy Spirit. You shall receive power. Who is love? Christ Jesus is love and a sound mind. We can have the mind of Christ. We can't be Christ, but we can think like he was when he was in a predicament. When he was in Gethsemane, he was in his right mind. But he had to possess. He had to get up from Gethsemane and go to Calvary. And that process was the good work. His father was busy working in him. As much as the good Lord is busy working in us this morning. Are you receiving something? When the church in Rome started living like Jews, they were now born again Christians and they started acting like Jews. Paul writes to the church in Romans 12, 2, he says, And do not be conformed to this world, to the ways of Rome. Don't be conformed to the ways of Judaism. You were Jews, you're now Christians. He says, But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It is Jesus. The good will of God is Jesus. The perfect will of God is Jesus. Amen. The acceptable will of God is Jesus. When you come to God and you, I say, Father, forgive me. He looks at his son. He says, what did you say, Jesus? He said, I said, forgive them. He said, okay, therefore I'll forgive you. Because none of us, we like, our good works are like filthy rags. You can sell as many cooks as you like. It doesn't make God love you more. But, but, but pastor, I, I quit on God. I turned my back. I backslid. And, well, come back like the prodigal. Just come back. The father was waiting for him. When's he coming home? He didn't judge him. He was praying for him. It's not wrong for you to desire your freedom sometimes because that nature in you. I want to take back my own life. I'm, I don't like this chiseling. Every morning I wake up, I feel the Holy Spirit chiseling all those hard parts of my life. But when he chisels, diamonds are developed under pressure. They're a lump of coal, black, you know, dark, in a mine. It's, 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 it's dirty work down there. But he chips, 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 and suddenly when he, he said last piece, bam, it out pops this beautiful gem. And that's what the Lord's doing with us this morning. He's chiseling away all those areas of your life. And allow Him to. Allow Him to. You know what you start to do when He, when he, when he prompts you? When he, when he puts a person in your mind that you've got ought against and you haven't spoken to and you've deleted on Facebook because you've got an issue? Go back and say sorry. It's the work. Jesus, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He, 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 he humbled Himself. God doesn't humble us. We have to choose humility. He humbled, his, cho his son chose humility. Jesus humbled himself so that we can have life. But sometimes we were thinking God's going to hit us with a big stick. No, God's not going to hit you with a big stick. God's waiting for you to just come to him privately. Put your, your one knee down in front of your bed and just say, Jesus, I'm available again this morning. Just work with me. Show, me. show me my future. Holy Spirit, you said you'd lead me, you'd guide me. I, I, it feels like everything is going the opposite direction. Why? Why is there, why is there, why is there, why is there turmoil? Why is there resistance? Why is, why is there feelings of irritability? Why am I so frustrated? And he's going, well, that's the, the point. Because you're so busy trying to sort it out. Now that you're silent in your inner room, now listen. And peace comes. <sighs> peace I give you. Not peace like the world gives you. The world says, play the lottery, win 40 million, you'll have peace. No, you won't. You'll have temporary happiness. And then you're going to have very little peace. Because you're going to have family members that love you now that never loved you for 20 years. Now they love you a lot. And when you come out your front door and your mother-in-law's on your couch, you must know things have changed. I always believed in you, son. Mm. Then peace leaves. Amen. But there's a peace. Paul said, I have peace, but I have little. And I have peace and I have much. I'm, not a, I'm a constant. I don't kick the dog one day, blame the pastor, blame my boss, blame my wife, blame everybody else, and then I'm right in my own eyes. Because all I've done is I've just delayed the work of God in my life. So get up in your thoughts. Then get up in your words. Jesus says, speak to your mountain. I'm not going to go into that this morning. I haven't got time. Let's speak about your mountain. Speak to it. Start to prophesy like it is done. 
Cape Town's a good place. Put your hands on your, on your business letter. It says, I call you blessed. I call you highly favored. Contracts I speak to you, come to me. Money, follow me. I call you in from, the, from across the waters. I call Cape Town a blessed place. May, your, may this name of this company be high and lifted up because I represent Jesus. Prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. Amen. Prophesy. Call the things that be not just as though they are. Prophesy. You have the authority to loose, to bind. Heaven's waiting for your words. When you loose, heaven loosens. When you bind, heaven binds. It's the authority given to the Christian. You are royalty. You're not a loser. You're above, not beneath. Amen. And finally, get up in your actions. 2 Kings 7 verse 3. The Bible says there were four lepers sitting at a gate. Cast out of the city because of their leprosy. Sometimes we make a mistake. We've got sin. We've made some foolish choices and we feel like we're leprous. Not physically, but in our makeup. He says, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. We can't go back. They've kicked us out. He says, if we sit here, we're also going to die. If I sit here on my couch and feel sorry for myself, I'm going to die. He said, now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we're going to die in any case. He goes, so let's look at the best option of the worst. Option one, we're going to die if we go back. Option two, we're going to die if we stay here. Option three is we're going to die if the, if the enemy kills us. Which one are we going to choose? Okay, let's choose option three. It's the best of the worst. And the Bible says they got up in their actions and they did something. I haven't got work, Pastor. Well, get up tomorrow morning, put some clean clothes on, and go offer your services for free. Get up in your actions. Go work for somebody for free. Sitting on your couch and earning nothing is also going to give you nothing. Working at a company for free is going to give you nothing. But now you have God with you. You have the ability for God's favor to rest upon you. When the boss goes, I've never met a man who hasn't placed demands on the company before. Who's this man? Get up in your actions. The Bible says they got up and they walked. And as they walked, God reciprocated their faith and drove the Syrians out of the camp. And when they got there, the camp was empty. They were confused. The Bible says it was full of gold and silver. And going from a zero through leprosy, they entered the camp of the Syrians and gained all the spoils and took some of the spoils back. And when they got to the gate of the original city and knocked on the door, they said, what do you want? They said, we've got gold. And the door flung open. And they walked in. They came in with the camels and the donkeys and the, the, the gold. They said, come with us. They said, we can't. The Syrians said, no, we, we control the whole camp. Come. And they arrived. And Israel said, who are these men? And notice this. The Bible says their leprosy left them because when we do something that self-pity leaves us when we do something that famine leaves us when we do something that doubt leaves us but you have to get up in your actions amen now get up off your seat if you will this morning amen have you received something 